Good morning and welcome to the Amarillo Evangelical Baptist Mission. It's good to have you all with us this morning. It's good to have everybody here physically. It's good to have everybody here um, online. Uh, your presence still matters uh, to God, even if you're not right here with us this morning. Amen. So, so that'll be important. Uh, another thing, I like to share this, that the Word of God doesn't change. So whether you're in a church this morning or you're wherever you find yourself, you can listen to it any time, but it's not going to change. So you don't have to worry about trying to keep up with uh, an emerging trend or anything like that. It's always going to be the same. Uh, here in a minute, we're going to jump into some praise and worship music. Uh, we're going to get into some scripture and uh, hopefully hopefully just look look for the Lord this morning. Just study and find him. Amen. Let him speak to our hearts. But before we do that, uh, Gary, will you open us up in prayer? Well, I just want to thank you for this wonderful morning again. Father, I ask that you just forgive us of any ways that we've wronged you, Father God, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, speak to us by your Holy Ghost. Father, I ask that your word would just come alive. And Father, your word would just change our hearts. And that your word will, will, will bring the image of Jesus Christ inside of us so that other people can see you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.
Jesus. This morning again, welcome. It's good, good to have you with us. It's good to be here. Thank the Lord for the very first blessing we had this morning. He woke us up. Amen. So there's many things that we should be thankful for, even if sometimes we don't think so. And I know sometimes I'm guilty of that. They're like, oh, good morning. You say, huh? But what good is it? Eh, kind of grumble. And it's good for starters because God woke us up. So let's start off with some positivity and social media. Um, Gary and I were just talking about that this morning and, uh, and reusing it and reposting it and resharing it. The truth is that if, if it encourages you, if it, if it touches you, if it makes your day better, yeah, I don't think that's by accident. I, I think that's, that's divine intervention. And I think that we owe it to put it back out there and continue to flood the world Amen. with as much positivity as we can. So I want to start off with the first one today. It's actually a story. You might not can see it very well from where you're sitting or if you're watching. Uh, I'll just read it out loud to you. And uh, I kind of reminded me of Weldon. Actually, sorry, I had to pick on you. It said, a pastor asked an old farmer uh, decked out in bib overalls to say grace for the morning breakfast. Lord, I hate buttermilk, the farmer began. The visiting pastor opened one eye to glance at the farmer and wonder where this was going. The farmer loudly proclaimed, Lord, I hate Lord. Now the pastor was growing concerned. Without missing a beat, the farmer continued, and Lord, you know I don't much care for raw white flour. The pastor once again opened an eye to glance around the room and saw that he wasn't the only one to feel uncomfortable. Then the farmer added, but Lord, when you mix them all together and bake them, I do love warm, fresh biscuits. So Lord, when things come up that we don't like, when life gets hard, when we don't understand what you're saying to us, help us to just relax and wait until you are done mixing. It will probably be even better than biscuits. Amen. Within that prayer, there is great wisdom for all when it comes to complicated situations like we are experiencing in the world today. Stay strong, my friends, because our Lord is mixing several things that we don't uh, really care for, but something even better is going to come when he is done uh, with all of it. Amen. What'd you think? Well, did that remind me of you? Remind you of you? Okay. <laughs> Secondly, check this out. For no word from God will ever fail. We can lean on the word all the time. <clears throat> um, I like I like the farmer's prayer. Um, I'm trying to remember the prayer that Linville preached one uh, at, the, at the end of a sermon one time. Um, he got in trouble for it. Remember Judy, <laughs> Judy gave him a glance across the room? He said something about rub a dub dub. Thanks for the grub. Amen. And he got, <laughs> and he got a look for it. But uh, listen, talking to the Lord and saying thank you, I think if our heart's in it, we're serious about it, I think that's okay. And I do believe that the Lord has a sense of humor, but I believe that there's times when he absolutely does not. And it's very, very stern, uh -huh. very strong, and there's no joke about it at all. So um, thirdly this morning, uh, we need to be aware that the world acting like it does today is nothing new. The world is acting just like Pharaoh did. They fear the plagues, but they don't fear God. Big mistake. Ooh, yeah, yeah. There, there's a time coming when Jesus returns to take his people home. And the ones that thought it was all fun and games, they're going to realize very quickly, I, I should have done something different. And, and by then, prayerfully, it won't be entirely too late for them. But it could be. And lastly this morning, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Matthew 7, 24. And the rock in this case is representative of Jesus Christ. The rock, the foundation, the cornerstone, where, where all of our where all of our faith makes any sense at all. With without the rock, we don't have anything. Amen. So thank you, God, for sending your son. I'm going to jump into some questions, hopefully get our get our minds thinking uh, this morning. Now, the first question is, what is the Bible to you, and how would you explain it to someone else? If someone asks you, what even is the Bible? What is that? You know, um, I've called it I've called it two things. I've called it the roadmap, the roadmap of life. I've called it the instruction manual of life. A lot of times, people you ever, you ever hear somebody say. Uh, the kids don't come with instructions, okay? 
Uh, if, if they did, I certainly didn't read mine. Uh, <laughs> I didn't, I, I didn't, and I sometimes still don't do a great job. But I love my kids. I hope, I hope at the end of the day that's, that's going to be enough for them to realize I, I tried. But this is, this is truthfully an instruction manual for life. It really is, amongst other things. Yes, sir? I got a dog with the house. They were tearing it up, so I put some duct tape together. Yeah. And I put food on it. <laughs> there you go. I like that. It is. It's it's food. And as as you read more and more, you'll understand what he's saying by that. It's obviously you're not going to pick it up like a sandwich and take a bite out of it. But it's a different type of nourishment. I wish I could. It's a spiritual nourishment, right? <laughs> <laughs> Might not taste very good. <laughs> Secondly, do you spend any time thinking of what the Bible is not? You ever paid attention to what the Bible is not? There's a lot of misconceptions about the Bible. Many, many, many misconceptions about the Bible. Um, we're not going to touch all of them. I, we just don't have enough time, probably in our lives, to talk about all things the Bible's not. Uh, also, in an in a opposite manner, there's probably not enough time in the world to talk about what the Bible is. Uh, like I said, the, the short answer is it's the roadmap to life. The roadmap of life. Life in this life and life in the next. And lastly... How does study notes help us grow in our relationship with the Lord? Like uh, Gary this morning gave me some study notes. And, and just as I was to ask you just very openly, how does that help me? Yeah, I get to see I get to see prospectively his study and I get to learn from it. And then it might prompt my own study. And ultimately it's iron sharpening iron, even if he's not over here. Having the study with me one on one, I'm still being I'm still being sharpened with the information, and so I'm excited by that. And so, yeah. uh, I don't care where you get your information from. I, I would obviously test that it's a biblical source. Yes, sir. Like me, I like to uh, write everything down. I I, I have to, I, I do. I just write everything down to see. It helps me to remember what I wrote. Yeah. When you write it down. Okay. Instead of reading it, just said that's it. I don't do that. You remember that? You remember that training when you when you meet somebody new? You're supposed to say their name three times in that first interaction. It's supposed to help you remember their name. I'm terrible with names. Same here. Horrible. Like I'll see somebody, and it, and it really hurts me when somebody knows my name because they met me for the same amount of time. They know exactly who I am, but I don't know who they are. That bugs me. Because they're like, you know, it'd be like, good morning, Colin. I'm like, hey, man. And then and I, I think it's just... <laughs> Yeah, you're like, oh, I know he told me his name, and I just can't think of it. My, my brain draws a blank. Yeah. But study notes, that's why they created study Bibles. It's not for you to fall on the infallible words of the person studying. The, the word of God is infallible. There, there is no, no problem, no edits needed, no issues. But it's an interpretation, and, and based on where he or she or whoever was studying and found the data, that's where they're coming to the conclusion of what they believe the Word is saying. And a lot of it is compelling. There's a, there's a lot of good notes that they tie together. Uh, Dr. David Jeremiah, great study notes. But there's so many more than him, right? There's a lot. So um, use those notes and let, let it help you grow. And, and another thing I want to point out that if they reference scripture as a reason to support, I would I would say this, this will help you in your study. Go to the scripture they reference and see that you see it too. Because there have been in my studies times that I've gone and referenced scripture that was that was put down for me, and to me it didn't have anything to do with the story at all. And if that's the case, I won't use it again. Because I want it to coincide. I want God to be the leader and I want me to be the follower. I don't want that to ever be the other way around. Okay, so that's why that's why I want it to coincide with the word. Okay, so uh, I'm going to share some notes with you. This is from uh, God's Plan for Man, and I forget the author of the book this morning, but but I want to share with you. These are not my notes; these are these are his notes. Okay, but I thought it, I thought it, it matters this morning. What the Bible is not: the Bible is not an amulet, a charm, a fetish. Or a thing that will work wonders by its very presence without any voluntary agency. 
What does that mean? Yeah, but even if you read it, if you just read it, um, and it has no bearing on you, like, look, let's say you're just trying to read it as fast as you can, and you don't really pay any attention to it, you, you got to put some voluntary agency into actually yeah. trying to read and understand what it's saying and, and put some thought process into it. you got to voluntarily do that. That's right. Me having this um, up, on a, up on a shelf is not going to read that to me. Somebody might come in my house and be like, oh, he's a Christian. He's got a Bible on his shelf. And that's good. That's one reason to have it out there. But if, if that's the only place it ever stays, it's not really doing anybody any good. It's just there. Yeah. So the Bible does not claim to be any such thing. It does not claim, I'm sorry, it does claim that if one will study and practice its doctrine, you catch that? Study and practice, it will work wonders in the life now and hereafter. It will not benefit a man by its presence any more than a spring of cool water in the desert will benefit a thirsty man who refuses to drink. Okay? Yeah. Y'all remember the expression, uh, you can lead a camel to water, but you can't make a drink. Okay? This is the same thing. I, I can lead There's you to the word. To I can lead you, I can lead you right to right God. But you have to make a decision how real that's going to be for you. I don't get to make that choice for you. But I can bring you, I can bring you right to the feet of the cross and say, look, here he is. And, and then from there, it's a decision that you've got to make, right? The Bible is not, is not a book of chronological events or one unspoke, unbroken series of divine utterances. It was given piecemeal. A little here, a little there, and you'll notice that that's quoted to many men through 18 or more centuries. So you see Isaiah 28, verses 9 through 13. Now we're going to talk about that a little bit more. And I'll see you turning, Gary, so I'll give you a second. I'll have it on the screen, too. If y'all don't want to look it up, that's fine, too. Now there's, there's going to be a little bit of a warning here that we need, to be, we need to be kind of ready for and understand what's being said to us, okay? Chapter 28, verses 9 through 13. I guess you're trying to find it. No, go ahead. I'm, I can do that. It says right here, Who is he trying to teach? To whom is he explaining his message? To children weaned from their milk? To those just taken from the breast? Is that who he's trying to explain his message to? You know, it's, we're, it's interesting that the reference here is basically infancy to adults. It's, it's the growth. And when we start to believe, when we start to have any real connection to God at all in the beginning, we're, we're babies. We're babies needing to be fed. And, and a lot of times that feeding is done by somebody else. That's that's where the discipling of people in the church comes from. It's, it's you know, you working with new believers and checking in on them and asking how things are going. And, and they're going to share with you that life isn't always roses. Right. And you're supposed to say, look, it never was, and it's not going to be. E even though you have a relationship with God, it doesn't mean that your life just gets all of a sudden better, that you're not going to have any trouble at all. That's right, yeah. It just lets you know that you're not going through that trouble alone anymore. Well, he's right there with you. So, so that's where the dependency has to grow when you say, Lord, I don't have any idea what's going to happen. Uh, but I know that you do. I know that you know what you're doing. And I'm not concerned by that. I just, I, I just trust you, and I ask that you'll help me to keep my focus on you, no matter what, right? And it says, verse ten: For it is, to, uh, do do this, do that, a rule for this, a rule for that, a little here, a little there. Catch that? The Bible is filled with uh, with what we should do. The Bible is also filled with consequences, like beforehand, if we choose not to. And some people will say, well, the Bible is a rule book. That's all it is. It's just law. It's just God telling you, do this, do that. You know, a little here, a little there. And I will say that a little here, a little there is true because there have been times that I've wondered about stories in the Bible where it doesn't go any further. It doesn't, it doesn't explain whatever it is that I'm thinking on beyond that point. 
But what it does give us is what we need. And sometimes we get irritated with that statement. We're like, well, how do you know what I need? I don't have to know what you need because he knows what you need. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we start going, well, I wonder what happened. Uh, for instance, I'll share one with you. When it talks about uh, the father and his sons, and then it'll say in the word, it says he had other sons and daughters. Well, who were they? What happened with them? Did they, leave, did they live uh, lives that didn't matter? Or were they just not talked about for another reason? And I wonder that sometimes. But you know what? The word doesn't come back and say, and call, because you were wondering. <laughs> it, it doesn't. And so sometimes uh, you just have to say, you know what? And people will say, well, use your imagination. I think that's dangerous. I just say, you know what? You just have to get to a place where you say, I don't know what happened. You know? Because that is the truth. When we start to use our imagination, we'll say, well, you know, they must not have believed in God. They must have gone to hell or whatever. And, and I would say that that's probably not a safe place to play that. I would just say, you know what, the word doesn't say, so I don't, I don't really know. Maybe if that if that's important enough that when I get to heaven, that if I still remember that question, if it's important enough, I'll ask him then. Yeah. <laughs> but I have a feeling that it's not going to carry any importance when I get to heaven, right? It's going to be, you know. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's about trust him and whatever he's doing. Now, now here's the warning. Verse 11. Very well then, with foreign lips and strange tongues, God will speak to his people. I want to visit that. I'm going to come back to that. To whom he said, this is the resting place of repose. But they would not listen. Okay. When, I, when it says foreign lips, do you ever suppose that God speaks to you through somebody else? I, I, I do all the time. And, and I don't always catch it. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I catch it every time it happens because I don't. It's usually later when I'm by myself. And I get to thinking about it. And I'm like, man, that was God. That was God showed up right in front of me and said something I really needed to hear. And I didn't, I didn't recognize his presence at all. I just missed it. Completely missed it. I think God will speak to you through people that you, you sometimes least expect. That's, that's it. Yeah, you won't think about it at all. And he'll just show up and talk to you. He'll give you that encouraging word. Or he'll give you that hug. Or that handshake and let you know things are going to be okay. Sometimes God shows up in that way. And people say, well, is that what God sounds like? God sounds like many things. God sounds like whatever he wants to sound like. Sometimes God is the conviction inside of us. People say, well, how can you say that that's conviction? That, that's just us. That's not just us. That's not our conscience. Because guess what? We just shared this morning, right? We we're talking about there's no good in us. There's no good in us. So when that good comes in, it says that we need to fix something, we need to correct something. That is him inside of us. That's his goodness that's saying, hey, you need to fix that. You're better than that. You should have said that. You should clear that up, right? That's God inside of us telling us to make it better. To look for forgiveness in a situation where we, we screwed up, right? I like how it says, this is a resting place of repose. But they would not listen. And that's the problem. The, the, the word is supposed to be a place of rest for us. We're supposed to be able to apply those words to our heart, know what it says, trust him, and, and, and live following him and not worry about anything else. But we get to a place where we, we think of God as the God that we can pray to when somebody's in the hospital about to die, potentially pass away. Or, but but we, we feel like for some reason God is not big enough to help us in our finances or to fix our car. Mm -hmm. We start setting limitations on God. Like, I don't want to bother God with the nonsense. Mm -hmm. But God wants to be bothered with the nonsense. Yeah, sure. God wants to be part of that relationship with us. We should be praying. Check this out. This, this is going to hit somebody. We should be praying to God just as much when life is great as we do when life is terrible. Mm -hmm. That's hard. But there's a lot of thank yous. And Lord, thank you for this blessing. I know that was you. I, I hope that everybody in this room, I, I know it took me a while to work on, um, but I, I started to do it. And, and sometimes I probably still miss, but I try not to. Is that I say thank you for everything that I eat. Every food that's given to me or every food that I, even if I go warm it up at work, I, I warm up a TV dinner before I eat. I say, Lord, thank you for providing this food. Right. right? And, and because I know that it all comes from him. 
And we, we get twisted up sometimes. We think that we did that. And we didn't do that. He did that. He made all the means. He made all the way possible for that to happen. Mm -hmm. It was all by his hands. Verse 13 says, So then, the word of the Lord to them will become, Do this, do that. A rule for this, a rule for that. A little here, a little there. So that as they go, they will fall backward. They will be injured and snared and captured. Because they will misunderstand what the Word of God is. They will look at the Word of God as a rule book. And when does a rule book come out? When you're in trouble, right? When you want to know what the rule is. Oh, I, I screwed up. We better go consult the rule book and find out what I need to do to, to fix it. Right? I'll tell you another thing that a Bible is not. If you have an uneven table at your house... This isn't a good good thing to put under the table to make the table <laughs> believe. Right? There, there are certainly better things you can do, right? This is my note here. It says, having a coffee can Jesus in your life will never be enough. And that's what I'm talking about. When is your coffee can down on the table? When you're going to make coffee. So you have to be in the mood. You have to want coffee. Otherwise, it's in the cabinet or it's on the shelf. It's not being messed with. Okay? We cannot contain Jesus on a shelf or in a cabinet in the kitchen uh, and take him down when we feel like we need him. <laughs> because the truth of the matter is, is that we need him all the time. Whether life feels like it's amazing or life feels like it's terrible. You can't just call on him or call on his name when things in life are not going your way. And you certainly will not reach the fullness of Jesus Christ that way. This would point at a complete lack of understanding of the relationship he has called us into with him. And, and we need him all the time, as I've said before. In the same way, keeping your Bible in the car or on your desk at work will not promise any more safety in your day. An unopened Bible won't do more for you than a gas nozzle that isn't hooked up to a pump. Right? You never get anything out of it. You squeeze that trigger all day long, buddy, but it ain't going to do nothing. So there has to be that commitment on our end, right? Mm -hmm. And even if that commitment still has to exist, even if at the end of the day, your answer is, I don't believe. You should be able to understand for yourself why you don't. God actually prefers that you know where you stand. The Word says that. That doesn't mean you're, you're going to reap the same benefits as a believer and a follower of Christ. But what the Lord gets irritated with is lukewarm people. Somebody right in the middle that wants to play that line. He'd rather have you be a, a for sure believer or a for sure non-believer. Just easier to distinguish. And he gets to distinguish anyways. Thank goodness it's not me. Right? I'd, I'd mess that up so badly. I'm so glad it's him. <laughs> Amen. People who live this way are often the people that are trying to meet some type of a Christian quota. Even though they may not see it. These, these folks are the ones, and, and look, I, I don't want us to sit here and try to point at them and try to figure out who they are. Whether they're in this room or not, whether they're in your life or not, you just want to make sure that this is, this is supposed to inspire conviction in us to make sure it's not us. It's not you personally, right? If you're going to church to try to say at the end of the year, you know, I went to church uh, 49 of the 52 weeks this year, I'll tell you what, I ought to get some kind of, some kind of recognition for that. I'd say if that's the case, you're going to church for the wrong reason. Right. Yes, sir? You know, uh, what you just said, people who live this way are often the people that are trying to meet some type of quota. Uh, I can vouch for that. I say, I, I'm trying my best is to let Christ shine through me. Yeah. And I'll never see it happen. You know what God says? says says, you're really trying too hard. Just... Let me do it. See, he wants to do it to us, but see, we're trying in our own strength to make it happen, and that we'll never do it. Can I share something with you, my brother? Huh? Can I share something with you this morning? God has done it, because I've seen him in you. Me personally, I've seen him in you. So, so, it, so it is happening. It does happen. If, if people can't see the love that you have for just people in general, then they're blind, because it's right in front of them all the time. God is in you, brother. 
Keep doing what you're doing. It's always been like that. That's how I've always looked at him. Yeah. As a good Christian guy, that God's with him always. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about what the Bible is. The Bible is God's inspired revelation of the origin and destiny of all things. It is the power of God unto eternal salvation and the source of present help for body, soul, and spirit. Would you all agree with that? That's, that's and really, just to say what the Bible is in that small of a, of a paragraph there, that's, that's pretty solid. It's pretty solid. I think it pretty well covered it. If you want to go with me to Romans chapter 1, we're going to read verses 16 and 17. And uh, like I said, I, I hope that this will inspire our reading. I hope that uh, I'm going to give you some references at the end. I hope that you'll make note of them. If you want them afterwards, let me know and I'll go back to that screen. I'll give them all to you again. And those references there again, I don't want to take credit for them. I got them all out of uh, God's plan for man. I did, I did borrow a lot of the notes this morning, and so uh, I'll let you know that right up front. I, I don't want to lie about it. And uh, Romans 1 verse 16 says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. I, I kind of got to thinking about that. So when Jesus comes back, the first people that are going to rise up, assumably, are the Jews. The Jews will be the first ones up. And then the Jews will get to watch the Gentiles pulled right behind them. It's going to be a pretty wild experience, don't you think? Like I say, can you imagine walking your dog through a cemetery? That <laughs> It's going to get your attention something quick, right? First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Verse 17 says, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And that goes back to what I was saying a minute ago when I say, oh, no, I wonder what happened. What's the rest of the story? And you have to move forward, not knowing the rest of the story, agreeing that it just isn't there, that you don't know, and you're going to focus on him anyways. Even if you're irritated with that. I've been, you, you ever been irritated before with the story? I have because I want to know what happened. But we still call to keep our focus on him and just keep moving forward anyways. Yes, sir? Like that scripture, righteous to live by faith. Why don't yes. you explain that to people who might be watching? Don't, don't understand what you're saying. Tell them what it means. Yeah, you, you want to you live by faith following the, 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 the way that Christ calls for us to live, the way that we're called to be. We're, we're called to be good. We're called to love our love our enemy like we love ourselves. We're called to love our neighbor. Uh, we're called to be good to each other, pray for each other, meet the needs of each other, not to judge each other. That's to walk in a path that is righteous. And, and we're called to walk in that righteousness. And we do so because we have faith in who he is and how it ends for us if we follow him with all we have, with all that we are. Yeah, I mean, I, if you ask anybody... I don't care if you, if I have unbelievers listening to me right now. Even if I was to ask you right now, when you die, do you want to go to heaven or hell? And some people will say, well, neither exists. And I feel bad for you because I think you're going to find out in a negative way if you don't change your mindset before then that they both exist. They're both very real. But let's say that you're willing to play the game with me. And I say, would you want to go to heaven or would you want to go to hell? I don't think anybody's going to say, I want to go to hell. I heard people say that. Uh, and I've heard people say it too. I think, I think there's a, I would call it a, a block, a block in, in, a, in what I would call intelligent thought. Some people just say because they're mad, they're angry, they, maybe they want to rile you. Up. But I really don't believe that their heart believes that. No. I, I can't believe that somebody would know the difference between heaven and hell and say, you know what, I want hell. I mean, <laughs> they don't want to change. That's why they want hell. He would like, it would be like saying, I want to jump out of an airplane without a chute. And I don't want anybody to come to my aid. I just want to smash into the mountains. Some people are like that too. Uh, you're right. <laughs> so I don't understand it, but it does exist. John 15, verses 7 and 8. Now, like I said, when the words of the Bible are read, those are the words of Jesus being recorded. 
And so we're going to cover some red letters. Y'all, y'all are listening to the song Red Letters? Nate, if you get a chance, go to YouTube and look up Red Letters, the song. Um, it's telling us that if you don't, if you, if first in your reading, if you don't pay attention to anything else with like solid focus, make sure you focus on those red letters. Right? Verse 7 says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Now I want to I want to talk to you about this for a second. This this is another verse that a lot of people misinterpret. People think that they can ask for riches and mansions and Bugattis and whatever else. And and if that's what God wants you to have, if that if that's the thing that He wants you to have that's going to bring glory to Him, then by all means I could easily see it happening. Whatever those things are. But it's not, it's not about things, see, because if we're, if we're dialed into God, we're not going to ask for things that give us a lot of selfish gain. We're going to be looking for things that bring glory to Him anyways. We're going to be focused on His will for us and for other people. And so we're going to ask for resources. Uh, you might be a small <laughs> church looking for money. You might be a small church looking for um, different, different organizations to get involved, like, like a food bank or something of that nature. To be able to meet the needs of people. So I, I don't think this is going to be like, you know what, Lord, what I really need is I need a I need a brand new Cessna jet. I'll probably never fly it, but it'd be really cool to have it in front of the house. I, I, I think it's easy for us to get lost in, in what that's actually saying. Okay? Not to say that I, I would never limit the power of God. There again, if God said, you know what, for you to further my mission for you, my will for you, I need you to have a Cessna. He's going to park a Cessna for your house. Okay, if that's what he wants you to have. However, that that's probably not what many of us need. And so I don't want to feed some kind of negative, non-truthful story here. Okay, but I believe that if you need resources, and he knows that you need resources, he's going to find you some resources. He'll make it happen. Okay. Do you want to be a follower of Christ? And that's what it means to be a disciple. That you're intentionally going to follow him with your life. And so you have, to, you have to answer that question to yourself. Not to me. You don't know that to me. But you owe it to yourself. So do you want to follow Christ? Going back to the, the God's plan for man notes. It is God's will and testament to men in all ages, revealing the plan of God for men here and now and in the next life. It is the record of God's dealings with men, past, present, and future. It contains God's message of eternal salvation to all who believe in Christ and to eternal damnation to those who rebel against the gospel. Right? It's the promise and the warning. And I say that a lot. It's the promise and the warning. And a lot of the word, as you read through it, is the promise and the warning. That if you do, that if you don't. You got me? And so you're going to see that a lot. I'm going to jump into 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verses 16 and 17. This is a reference that God laid on my heart as I was working on this. People say, well, how do you know, how can you possibly know that if a bunch of different men wrote the word, how could you rely on that? They say, you know, God is perfect, but the people who wrote the word are not perfect, so how can you believe that it's infallible? And I'm about to tell you why I can believe it's a problem. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Verse 17 goes on to say, So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That means that when man wrote it, God inspired it. God inspired every word that was documented he gave it to him wherever he was whatever time frame he was in whoever the author was right gave them the words to write down a document recording it is all god breathed could you imagine god saying grab a pen and write this down <laughs> you're probably gonna have your pen and be shaking a little bit because you're like oh my goodness and you want to make sure you don't miss a step 
I'm going to tell you, they didn't miss a step. God gave them what to write, and they wrote it. And it was recorded. And thank God we have it in front of us today. Uh, and then you get into the conversation or the argument, usually, of the different variations of the Bible. I've had people that want to argue about the different, um, the different denominations of church. And I stopped that argument. I figured out how to stop it. Not because I'm so smart, I just figured it out. Because God laid it on my heart when I had that conversation with somebody. And I asked them, I said, look, I'm going to cover with you to me what is the most important thing. Do you believe that there's one God? Just one? And they say yes. Now, do, you do you believe that he created the heavens and the earth? Yes. Do you believe that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross so that we may be forgiven of our sins and be saved and have eternal life? Yes. Well, then guess what? I don't care what denomination you're in. That, to me, is the most basic, fundamental truth of Christianity all by itself. Amen. The rest is going to be between you and God. You're talking about different interpretations? That creates divisiveness. And we that's why the churches have a, a, a Luther and a Pentecostal, a Baptist, or whatever, whatever, whatever. I'm not picking on any of them. I'm just saying that instead of having a conversation that led to saying, you know what? We, we may not know the answer to this question. We need to wait for God to reveal it to us. Somebody decided that I'm right, that you're right, that he's right, that he's right, and they broke off into groups. And instead of coming together, it created divisiveness. Amen. And that, that's, that's what concerns me. I like how 17 says, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I don't know about you, but I like to be prepared. Amen. I like to be ready. Not, nothing will give you more confidence when you have a conversation with somebody about God than knowing what you're talking about. And if you don't know, don't make it up. Please, don't make it worse. Just say, you know what? I'm not really sure, but I have a Bible right here. You want to look it up? Let's figure out what the Word says. We do it together. I think that has more value than anything you can say when you don't know. And then when they say, yeah, let's look it up. Then look it up. Guess what? You've got the Internet and all kinds of tools to reference something. And it'll tell you where to start. You can use all kinds of different things. There's also, uh, you know, depending on what Bible you have, you can look up certain word, words and phrases in the back, a concordance, and it'll tell you where to go in Scripture to find it. So there's all kinds of different things you can do to find stuff, right? Then I want to share with you some last thoughts and references. It is the book that contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Read it to, to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. The Bible is. Here's a bunch of references for y'all. So like I said, if you want some of these afterwards, let me know before I turn my computer off. I'll turn it back on if you miss me, okay? Not a big deal, but I want you to have them. The Bible is a mirror to reflect. James 1, 23 and 24. A hammer to convict. Jeremiah 23, 29. A seed to multiply. 1 Peter 123. Water to cleanse. Ephesians 526. A lamp to guide. Psalm 109, 105. Food to nourish, including milk for babes. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. Bread for the hungry. Matthew 4, verse 4. Meat for men. Hebrews 5, verses 11 through 14. Honey for dessert. Psalm 1910. Rain and snow to refresh, Isaiah 55.10, and a sword to cut, Hebrews 4.12. Okay? Uh, that is not all that it is, but that is 11 powerful references that will hopefully inspire further study. And you can see what the word is and how it's meant to be used and how we're, we're called as followers of Christ to gain knowledge of it and use it to gain knowledge of others. Educate people on who he is what he's about, and, and don't just tell him, look, th this is not just a rule book. This is so much more than that. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is about a God who loves us, who has intentionally, on his own grace, decided that he wanted a relationship with each and every one of us. Not because he owed it to us, because he certainly did, but because he chose to. Right? He wants to have fellowship with us. 
He's knocking on our door. He's knocking on our door even right now this morning. And if you've never before opened that door to let him in, might you open the door today and just say, Lord, I want you in my life. I, I don't know very much about you. I'll be honest. Maybe, maybe you've not spent any time in the Word. Be honest about that. I don't know you that way, but I want to. I pray that you'll show me where to start. If there's somebody that needs a Bible, we'll, we'll find a way to get you a Bible. Reach out. Uh, we're on YouTube. You can look up AEBM. Uh, you can look up my name, Kyle Keller. Uh, you can look up just about anything about us. If you need a Bible, we'll find a way to get a Bible. Uh, whatever it takes, we'll figure it out. Um, but I don't want you to leave knowing less than you do when you got here. I want you to have information, education, and then make what I would call an educated decision as to whether or not you are a believer. Amen? It's good to have you all with us this morning. Um, prayerfully, we'll understand what the Bible is, what it's for, and get away from all the human-created traditions that have nothing to do with Scripture at all yeah. and focus more on God Himself and know that we do that because He is God, and, and I am not, right? So that's the most important thing. Brother Rudder, will you close us in prayer? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this message. To open up our hearts. Lord, we just pray that you take your hands for surgery, that the doctors Amen. do what they need to do, and Lord, just bring her through it. Yes. And to help her get, get well. Lord, just be with us as we go our day. Lead and guide us. For you are the master of the times. Again, before we fail you, Lord, for your name we pray. Amen. 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 Tune in next week. We hope to see you then.